Hey Numa family, this is Enoch. I just want to welcome you to our Sunday service. Welcome, welcome, and we are glad that you could join us. You know, and uh, before we get into our service, I just want to encourage us with a verse because in this week, I found myself thinking and I was like overthinking about something. And then this verse came into my mind um, in John 14, 27. And it says, um, peace, I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So I was really encouraged about this verse. And I just want to encourage you that you may find yourself like in thinking and, you know, this thought that comes and stressing. I just want to encourage you. So I just want to pray for us uh, before we get into the service. Father, thank you for these people. Thank you that you could bring us together and worship you. Thank you, God, Lord, Father, that God, Lord, Father, you see us through no matter what we are going through. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
grace to lay down our idols today it's not grace to lay down our idols today it's not grace to lay down any other god we praise it's not any other thing we set our hearts on Jesus, our Savior, you love will conquer the grave. You are unchangeable, unchangeable, unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's who you Are you interested in church leadership or, or leadership within a church context? Maybe you've played in some sort of leadership role before and you've been burnt out. Maybe you have no reference at all and you're curious. Or maybe the model that you have experienced has, has been unhealthy. Uh, you, you've actually seen like what not to do. 
We are going to go on an eight week journey together around leadership within the church. We're going to take an introspective look into what has shaped and formed our ideas around leadership, uh, what that looks like for us, how we can be our authentic selves and living out what God has called us to uh, within the church. If that's you, if one of those things resonated with you, uh, we'd love for you to make contact with us. You can direct message us or send us an email, and we'd love to give you more details around the times, the dates, and what this is going to look like. Hope that you will join us, and looking forward to connecting with you soon. Hello, I'm Trudy Brookman. It's my first time preaching in Numa Church, so um, I'm asking for your grace um, towards me. Um, uh, let me tell you just a few lines about myself. I'm an attorney. I do consumer law, married to Gerard van Merbe. He's, a, he's an urban designer. We live in the Boerkarp. And um, if you're interested, I am allergic to Feinbos. I think that's enough about me. Let me jump into where we're going today. Um, John 20, verse 24 to 29. If you want to turn there in your Bible so long, you're most welcome. Um, and while you are looking at that, I want to almost put a little challenge to you as a thought, not a, not a heavy thing. Um, I'm 49 now, and for the last few years, I've been thinking, isn't there like a one thing that one could focus on to get to uh, a life that's really successful? And I'm, I don't mean financially successful, I mean... Uh, if one could get to the end of your life and feel, well, my life has really been worthwhile, could there be one thing that you could really focus on and achieve that? If there is, I definitely want to know about it. And I, I think I've found it, at least for me, um, and I'm going to be talking about that toward the end of the message this morning. But let's start by looking at um, the story from Scripture, John 20, verse 24. I'm going to read it to us from the NIV. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came to appear to them. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later... The disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas responded, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. As I was preparing this message, I must admit I developed a little bit of a soft spot for Thomas. What do we know about him? Um, I, we um, know from the, from the passage that he had a twin brother or sister. We know that he was one of the 12 disciples, and by the time that the story plays out, um, he would have been with Jesus and the other disciples for a good three years. Um, maybe I can give a little bit of background information about how discipleship worked in those days. Um, I must say, as I was reading about it, I was quite astounded. Um, so how it worked is that a Hebrew boy would start with his schooling at about age six, um, and he would be taught the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And being taught, I mean quite literally, the boys were taught to recite it. So by the age of um, 10 or so, the boys would be able to recite the five books of the Bible. And then the best of them, the best scholars, the kids who were really performing best in, the, in this uh, schooling setup, would continue on until they were about 14 and then be taught further books of the Bible, which they would also learn to recite. Um, they were then in a position where the best of those boys would then compete like crazy to be admitted 
as a disciple of the rabbis. The rabbis in those days were super influential figures. Um, they were witty, they were charismatic, they were really looked up uh, to in society, and becoming a disciple of a rabbi was a huge thing. The rabbis were incredibly choosy about who they accepted as their disciples. It was a long-term relationship, and they were looking for a young guy who was able to show the devotion and dedication to really be able to duplicate their teaching, not just in terms of um, having the same skill set as them, but also being able to reflect in their lifestyle, in their character, um, the values that that rabbi really stood for. Um, so when Jesus came to the disciples to his disciples and approached them and said follow me it was a no-brainer for them of course they dropped whatever they were busy with and they followed Jesus um, so that's the context in which Thomas became a disciple of Jesus and the idea was in those days that you were a good disciple if you were covered in the dust of your rabbi in other words you were walking right on the on his heels and his dust as he was walking was falling on you um, and you were hurrying to keep up so that not a word would drop out of his mouth without you picking it up. He would not make a move without you making the same move. And the idea was absolute emulation so that you could almost become a replacement uh, for that rabbi when he retires one day. So, um, yeah, Thomas was a, was a disciple. So he was probably, if, he, if Jesus had selected disciples in the same way that the other rabbis did in his time, um, Thomas was probably a high school kid, uh, probably about 17 by the time that we meet him, 16, 17. Um, just uh, as an aside, um, we see through scripture that the disciples call Jesus, who was their rabbi or teacher, um, my Lord. And that was just a, word, a, a, a sign of respect. I think when we say my Lord, we mean God. It, it wasn't the case. It didn't indicate uh, that the disciples thought that Jesus was God, um, th that came later. Um, so what else do we discover about uh, Thomas in Scripture? There are really two other incidents prior to the one that I've read about where we get um, an inkling of his character and his personality. The first one is, a, is an incident just before the cross happened where um, Lazarus is desperately ill and the disciples and Jesus are discussing whether they'll go back to Bethany. The problem with Bethany is that the Jews there, the previous time that they were there, took offense to something that Jesus had said and started stoning them. So they were going right back into the, uh, into the place of danger. Um, Thomas's comment, which is recorded in scripture, is that he said, Let's go back to Bethany. Let's go with Jesus, even if we are going to die with him. So he's a guy with real courage and devotion um, toward his rabbi, toward Jesus. Then there's another incident which is recounted where Jesus is teaching his disciples and actually teaching about his death and resurrection and, and heaven. So he says to the disciples, I'm going to my father. I'm going to prepare a place. Uh, for you there and I don't know whether they understood that he meant heavenly father rather than Joseph um, I'm going to prepare a place for you there then I'll come back and I'll um, and, and I'll collect you but you know the way there and you will follow me there so Thomas pipes up and he said Lord we don't know the way <laughs> but we don't know the way how will we be able to follow you there um, so you can see he's a bit like a teenager and he interprets things really literally but he also has the courage to speak up and ask the question um, so you get a little bit of a picture of his personality but by the time that this story unfolds we're encountering Thomas in a in a different mind space wow the events of the last few weeks and and the last few days really in his life have hit him hard um, his expectations have been shattered, shattered, his hopes have been disappointed. Um, he's seen his rabbi die before his eyes. And, and now, uh, a week or so later, when the other disciples, his closest friends, come to him and say that Jesus appeared to them in a locked room and showed them his 
hands with a with the holes from the nails and his side it, actually thomas can't stand it and he it, it it's too much for him and he and he gives quite an extreme response he says unless i see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side i will not believe and the greek um, which my husband has kindly interpreted for me, is, is strong, he's emphatic, there's a double negative there. He is saying, I will never believe if I don't. Um, why? Why so passionate? The other uh, disciples have given him some such strong evidence of, of the resurrection of the Lord. Why is he so emphatic in his out in this situation well I, I i think most of us have had moments of of this experience you're just over it you're over believing you're so disappointed you are mired in thoughts of if this thing didn't come through for me then isn't the whole isn't everything i believed <laughs> a, a farce is it is, is anything true and we get into that mind space uh, from time to time, don't we? And I, I don't want to undermine genuine questions. I think there are very genuine questions to be asked. And, and with Thomas, you know, he had seen the Lord die. And there are all kinds of reasons out there that people might see things <laughs> or describe things that might not be literally true. And it's worthwhile checking out the evidence. And that really leads me to... Uh, yes, to the next area that I just want to discuss with us, investigating the evidence. I was really struck um, by uh, the sermon that we had last week where um, uh, Mary misses the evidence right in front of her <laughs> because she's so tearful um, and she gets the wrong end of the stick. Then uh, Peter comes running in um, and he actually looks inside the tomb. And, and because he's been brave enough to enter into the, into the now open tomb and look at the evidence there, the folded uh, linen, uh, John is emboldened to, to come and look at as well. And as they see the evidence before them and, and they engage with it with their brains, it's not logical that if there's a grave robber that they would unwind all of the uh, linen and fold it up neatly. Surely not. If the Jews were coming to obfuscate matters, they would take the linen with them. What is going on here? We need to give this a rethink. They engage with the evidence in front of them. Um, with Mary, yo, it takes a while for her to get the penny to drop because she's still in tears after the guys have left. Um, and then but then when she also looks inside the empty tomb, she sees two um, angels there. And as they talk to her, she turns around. And then once again, she's still not got her bearings because when Jesus appears to her, she thinks he's the gardener. Maybe she's crying a lot and she can't see properly out her eyes. But when he says her name, she recognizes the voice. So for the disciples, they recognized the evidence. They, they looked and saw the evidence, engaged their minds, drew the uh, conclusions, and then they believed. With Mary, she recognized the voice of her master, and she was able to believe. Um, with the disciples who were in the closed room uh, at, during the incident when, when Thomas wasn't there, they believed because the Lord appeared to them even though the doors were locked, supernaturally. A supernatural uh, event from the Lord's side is bound to grab our attention, right? Um, and it makes us believe. Um, signs and wonders, they are there to give us a reason to wonder and to see the sign and to believe. Um, so um, in Thomas's case, I'm sure rather brashly he's asking for evidence of jesus's resurrection but his thinking is approximately right because if the person who appeared to the other disciples wasn't really jesus then he wouldn't have holes in his hands and in his side that would be proof that the that the 
person who appeared was really Jesus, and that's what he needs to ascertain. Um, and then secondly, if he is able to put his finger in the hole, ghastly as that thought is, honestly, to modern people, um, then he can make sure for himself that this isn't a ghost or an apparition or some uh, flight of their imagination, but a, a, a flesh and blood person. So Thomas is looking for evidence, even though he expresses it in a, in, in a, in a fairly rude manner. <laughs> okay. Um, as I say, I have a soft spot for, for Thomas because I have moments of brashness uh, myself. So, yeah, maybe I can have a little um, indication of what, what my experience has been with um, having questions. I, I think there's a narrative in Christian circles, which may or may not be uh, right, depending on the situation, that, you know, we will never know the answers that we, of the questions that we put to God this side of eternity. We need to wait till heaven and then all will be made clear. Um, but actually, I've had a wonderful experience of, um, of the opposite, of the Lord really answering a question which was heavily on my heart. I had a, um, a best friend who was uh, murdered oh, many years ago. It was around about 2001. And uh, we were so young at that time. We were about, he and I were about 28, 29. And I was just saying to the Lord as I was um, trying to come to grips with this murder, um, why, Lord, why would you take him at such a young age? And, um, and I found the Lord dropping an answer into my mind, which was something that I definitely couldn't have come up with myself, especially in my <laughs> distraught state at, at, the, at the time. Um, I, I, I mean, it's really a, a personal thing, and I don't want to speak badly of a person who's died, but the Lord explained to me that um, he was snatching him out of a situation of grave danger and sinfulness in, down which he was sliding, and it was the case. And I saw it, and it just felt as though the Lord was um, demonstrating his nature as a loving father to call his son to himself, take him out of danger, and just bring him into his bosom at that time. And to me, it was a really satisfying answer. So I will be eternally grateful to the Lord for his grace in giving me that answer. At the same time, I want to acknowledge that not all our answers come at the time that we ask the question and that the Lord has a process and the Lord has timing which is um, individualized according to our situation. So if you're in a position where you are truly, I wish the Lord would just give me those answers, the same as you, I want to say I'm with you and my heart bleeds with, with you. Um, and that... Um, the words of, of Jesus to Thomas actually really encouraged me, where he says right at the end, um, blessed are those who have not seen and who still believe. The, the Lord honors those of us who are able to hang on and wait for an answer, um, in, even in the, in the light of evidence to the contrary. Um, so let's go back to Thomas's story. Um, He's made his, he's put his, his position out there, and then a week later, he's in the room with the disciples, and Jesus appears. But he doesn't just appear. He appears supernaturally. He makes an entrance. Um, and he, he greets the disciples, peace be with you, and then he addresses Thomas directly. And I want to ask you... Um, especially those of you who've been Christians for a, lot, for a while and you feel you know the Lord, what do you think the tone of voice of Jesus was when he spoke to, uh, to Thomas? Do you think he was uh, rebuking? Do you think he was stern? Do you think he was um, humorous, fatherly, <laughs> kind in his style of speaking? I, I can't give you the answer to that. But it seems to me that what Jesus says is certainly exceptional and that the contents of what he speaks is, is certainly kind and fatherly and, um, and honoring toward Thomas, even though Thomas had been expressing his, un his unbelief in such a brash manner. Um, Jesus invites Thomas to come. In fact, in the Greek, um, once again, Harat uh, translated for me, um, the Greek literally says, Thomas, bring that finger of yours here. Here's my hand. Come put it in the, in the, in the hole created. 
so it's a graphic. <laughs> um, uh, Thomas doesn't just get his answer from Jesus. So it's not just that Jesus shows him the nail holes and the hole in his side. He also demonstrates his nature as God by knowing supernaturally that Thomas had made those comments, by repeating the very words that Thomas had used a week ago. Um, so by the way that Jesus A, arrives in the room and then responds to Thomas before Thomas is able to express to Jesus where he is at, um, Jesus is demonstrating that he is omniscient, in other words, all-knowing and omnipresent, um, present everywhere all the time and knows what is going on on the inside of our, of our minds. Jesus has gone from being fully man to being fully God again. And this is um, so impressive to, I think, everyone who was there, but in particular to Thomas, who is being single, singled out by the Lord, that his response, he, I, I think it just escapes his lips. He says, my Lord and my God. And what he's saying here is, my Lord, okay, they've been calling Jesus my Lord. He say, uh, for, for the three years that they have been his disciples. Um, and it's the same expression of respect that he has been uh, using. And what he's saying here is, my familiar, beloved rabbi. <laughs> and then he goes on and he says, and my God. In other words, um, I acknowledge that you are not just a human being who we saw eat and sleep and walk <laughs> and get dirty um, uh, and get tired uh, like us, but I acknowledge that you are the son of God, that you are God yourself. Um, so this is an expression of, of faith, and that's all we need to become, to become children of God, right? That's how we get saved. We need to acknowledge that Jesus is our Savior and is, and is God. Um, it really is as simple as that. So um, just to explain that my Lord and my God is an expression which was a translation of uh, the words, uh, Yahweh Elo Elohim, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that right, um, that's the Afrikaans version, <laughs> Maybe Yahweh Elohim, um, which was the Greek translation, and everyone who knew a little bit of Greek in those days would know that um, Yahweh Elohim is translated, my Lord and my God. So what he's saying, everyone would have understood um, as an expression that Thomas is saying, Jesus, you are not just my rabbi, you are God himself. So maybe I can be so bold as to make a few suggestions with regard to doubt. Um, uh, doubt can be a, a big thing, maybe doubting the existence of the Lord, maybe it's just doubting a particular character aspect or having run into disappointment, um, having run into a type of offense um, that is bound to happen at some stage if you hang around in church, but, but um, of course that is the only thing to do nevertheless. Um, I want to suggest that Thomas gives us a really good um, style of dealing with doubt in, in various ways. Maybe one can turn down a bit on the brashness, especially if that's not your personality type. Um, but what Thomas does is he keeps in fellowship. So you'll notice he um, disagrees with the disciples dramatically, but he's there. He is right there in the locked room with them when Jesus reappears. He hasn't withdrawn from fellowship. He hasn't gone home to be with his twin. He hasn't suddenly stopped coming to church or withdrawn or stopped praying um, in the way that is so tempting to do if you're falling into doubt. Um, and I want to I want to recommend that that one follows that approach. Keep talking to your to your Christian friends. Keep speaking, getting wise counsel in your life. Um, uh, stick uh, stick with a with a safe place. Um, then I want to encourage you to not switch off your brain. Proactively and forensically investigate the evidence that is available to you. Um, 
don't get mired in your emotions and make an emotional decision. Differentiate between what the Christians did and what the Lord is actually um, responsible for. <laughs> you can find Christians have failings, and but the Lord actually isn't the one that we can hold responsible for those things. Um, it's really helpful to not have excessively high expectations of Christians. After all, we're the people who were so sinful that we realized we needed a savior, right? And that's the unifying characteristic of all Christians. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. Um, yeah, I, the church is the, is the plan of God for, for redemption. So I recommend that one. Stick with church, <laughs> stick with church despite your doubts. And then um, I love the fact that um, Thomas was able to express his doubts um, rather than keep it to himself. I, I think it's, it's suitable to express your doubts, especially to God and humbly listen to an answer if he chooses to give you one. Um, I think it's really helpful to not put expectations on God as to the format or the timing or the nature of the answer that you're expecting to give because he's a rather large personality who does what he likes in any event. Um, so you can only, you can, you can get it wrong. You can definitely get it wrong. So it's easier to just be quite open in terms of your expectations of how and when and if the Lord is going to give you an answer. Um, and then finally, don't linger in doubt. So that was the instruction of Jesus to Thomas, right? Don't continue in your unbelief. Um, deal with a thing. Make a decision as to what you think uh, the answer is. And maybe make a provisional decision. But keep going forward. Keep moving forward. Don't, don't get mired um, in your doubt. And then I want to talk about the thing that I thought was the key that determines whether your life is successful or not. And you can de de uh, definitely uh, disagree with me on whether this really is the key thing and maybe there isn't one key thing. But what I want to put to you is that Hebrews 11 says that you cannot please God without faith. So what does that mean? That faith pleases God that if we have faith that that is pleasing to God. Wow, is there anything beyond that. I, I, can, I, I can't really think of a thing more successful in life than pleasing God. So for myself, I have decided that I, I want to really demonstrate faith. So what that means for me is that um, I, I take the Lord seriously. So if the Lord speaks to me about a thing, um, if I have a conviction uh, about an aspect, I take the Lord seriously. Um, you know how the um, scripture says that Mary pondered the words in her heart. So I've, I'm not a very <laughs> thoughtful person, but I've tried to teach myself to ponder the Lord's words in my heart. I write them down, I look at them again, and I really consider what does this mean? If the Lord is um, giving me a promise about a particular role for myself or something like that, I get proactive. I go out there, I try to upskill myself, I, I try to learn, I look at uh, mentors. Um, so, um, yeah, without uh, stepping out too, too far, I, if the Lord says a thing to me, I want to try and take it as seriously as I can and implement as much from my side um, uh, to, to um, demonstrate that I'm that I'm partnering with the Lord on this thing um, really my um, faith levels I suppose um, took a jump really there was like a watershed moment for me which I didn't I've only realized in in retrospect where um, one evening in church I think um, I really just felt convicted to say to the Lord, Lord, I trust you. I have seen you perform in my life. I have seen your faithfulness. I've seen your faithfulness in my family over the, over the, the, the decades. And I want to trust you. So I'm telling you now, Lord, that if you tell me to do a thing, then I'm going to do that thing without 
having to make a new decision. I make the decision now in advance that if you say something to me, I'm going to just do it. Um, and that I'm going to do it promptly. And it's been such a freeing thing for me because now if the Lord says something to me, even if it sounds very strange, then I don't think about it, I do it. <laughs> um, so it sounds like quite a risky approach. It is a very risky approach. I'm very <laughs> I'm open about that. But faith really is spelled R-I-S-K. Faith is risk. Faith, faith is um, stepping out and taking a risk for the Lord. Um, at least that's my experience. Um, and my experience further is that taking those risks becomes easier and easier with practice. So that initially you think you might die in the process, but actually once you've done it a few times, it becomes really quite easy. So um, yeah, I, I just also feel that it's such a lifestyle of high adventure. I, I, I almost can't recommend um, taking the Lord seriously too highly. Um, I've just found that when your priorities are not so much on having a comfortable life, but rather being obedient and stepping out in faith and um, following the Lord in his slipstream, wow, stuff happens in your life that you could never have anticipated. You become a person that you couldn't quite have anticipated. And it's this incredible life of adventure where your little effort combined with the Lord's amazingness um, changes other people's lives and you see it, <laughs> you see it happening. And it's a life of, a tr of tremendous success. It's a, um, a, a life of impact, a life of um, real satisfaction and enjoyment um, and, and such an honor, honoring life where you feel as though you're partnering with God Almighty to do his amazing work in this world. I mean, what is better than that? In any way, let me, let me try and give you one example. Um, it's quite a silly example. Um, uh, in 2015, Karat and I were living in India um, doing mission work there. And I recall one morning, um, maybe let me just take one step back. My experience of this um, living out of faith is that the Lord gives me little crumbs. I don't get, Trudy, do this, and then you do that, and then that will happen. And then once that has happened, the big plan for this whole thing is that this and this and this will fall into place. Don't worry about that aspect. No, I get the first crumb, <laughs> then I have to walk past and once I've done it, then the Lord gives me the second crumb. So it's a real, maybe, maybe the Lord deals with you in more intellectual manners, but I, um, I get baby steps with the Lord and I'm very grateful because I can do one step at a time. Um, and, then, and then maybe he can give me another jobby and I can do that thing. So sometimes the um, breadcrumbs are quite far, far apart. So yeah, as I was saying in India, um, I'm, I'm often late, and this morning I was, I was late for work, um, so I'm scurrying along in those little alleyways uh, that you get in, in Delhi in between the roads. And um, every morning in India, I would wake up and say to the Lord, okay, Lord, what are we going to do today? Will you show me stuff? Will you point out things that I must do? You just tell me I'm going to do it. Just look me in the eye, and then I do the thing. So... As I'm scurrying along, I notice um, an Indian guy who is selling cauliflowers and onions on a little barrow. So they have guys who uh, have farms outside the city. They push uh, their produce into the city and then come and sell it to the, um, to, to the people in Delhi. And there were duly a little queue of ladies and then a few ladies hanging over their balconies. Uh, negotiating with this guy on prices for the cauliflowers and the onions in Hindi. So as I'm walking past him, the Lord says, him. So I'm like, okay. But by this time, I've been walking really fast because I'm late. So I've gone around the corner. So I have to step, I have to come back. So I'm walking back, go and join the end of the queue. But now by now, the Lord has just said him. He hasn't said what else. So as I'm standing in the queue, I am focusing on the Holy Spirit's voice. I'm like, Lord, any time now is good. What do I have to say? What must I do? What now? Yo, and the ladies in front of me are getting help. They're leaving with their cauliflowers. The woman upstairs has been sorted. 
and now I'm in the front of the queue and the Lord still hasn't said anything. So I'm like, mm, can I have a cauliflower? So the, I noticed that the guy, I don't know, his English is not very good, so I have to point to the cauliflower. So he says, no, you have to buy a kilo. I can't buy a kilo of cauliflowers. It's just Karat and me. We, we'd be eating cauliflower for months. Uh, anyway, so I'm like, okay, give me some onions. I'll have a kilo of onions then. So while I'm paying for the onions, the Holy Spirit tells me what to say. I can't remember exactly. Look, it was 2015. But something along the lines of Jesus knows your name and you must search him out. You must also find out more about Jesus. And I think to myself, the guy is Hindi speaking. His English is very scrappy. But I have told the Lord that I'll do what he says, so I say it. And as the guy is looking at me and giving me my change, he looks as though he absolutely comprehends what I'm saying. So I say it one more time, and it looks as though he's getting it because he has this huge, huge smile on his face. And he's nodding at me like a crazy man. But then the, there's this pushy lady behind me and she wants her cauliflowers. So I get pushed out of the line and I'm walking to work and that's the end of the incident. And I think to myself, well, you know, what does the verse say? Some sow and others reap. <laughs> anyway, I was sowing. Um, but I'm so confident that I'm going to see the cauliflower man in heaven when I arrive that the Lord's going to draw me aside and say, okay, now come. These are the people that you sowed seeds in their lives, can meet them now. The cauliflower man's actual name is so and so. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to see the smile again. So anyway, a few comments about um, the lifestyle of faith. Um, so I really want to want to land for us by encouraging you to think about faith, whether that's for you. Um, whether you are in a place with doubt and whether there are any proactive steps that you could take um, to maybe resolve that thing in your life um, and reach a place of, of, of greater certainty and faith. So, um, yes, maybe um, as I land for us, I want to ask whether if you are with other people, whether you would just close your, your eyes now and I want to pray, I want to pray for you. Um, and ask you to just take a few moments of time to look Jesus in the face, like Thomas. Look him in the face. He's appeared before you. Um, he's present wherever you are. Um, look him in the face and, 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 and maybe pour out your heart to him if you feel um, that you have something on your heart. If, you, if there's a doubt, um, this is a chance to engage with the Lord around that and put your questions to him. Um, can you, can you tell Jesus um, how you feel and, and, and do you have it in you to also release him from your expectations in terms of how or when or what he must answer you? Uh, do you feel um, that you could possibly today make a promise uh, to Jesus, that you will commit yourself to having faith, to demonstrating faith in your life. Um, and if you feel that this is for you, maybe it's just the moment for you to say to the Lord, um, Lord, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do that. I pre-decide that, um, that I will do whatever you say promptly. So, I, Lord, I want to bring before you everyone who is watching today, um, every person who sees um, this uh, broadcast, Lord, I want to ask that you would bless them with a gift of faith. Lord, we know that um, uh, we can uh, respond to you, but that you can really put our response on steroids <laughs> by giving us a gift of faith. I want to ask that you would strengthen your people with a gift of faith which um, empowers us, which makes us more effective and which really connects us to your heart because our faith pleases you. Lord, I want to ask that in Jesus' name. And then I want to turn um, to anyone who maybe has been listening to this podcast or um, broadcast today the, 
and has maybe never made a step um, of, of, of putting their trust in Jesus. Um, if that's you, um, I want to invite you um, to see the evidence, <laughs> to come in, as it were, put your finger in the, in the holes in the hands of, of the Lord who died for you, out of his deep love for you, um, and to commit your heart and your life to him. Uh, if you want to make that decision uh, today, all you need to do is um, to agree with that in your heart and to say to the Lord, I'm, I am available to you, I want to serve you, I want to trust you, I believe. I believe that you are the uh, um, salvation um, uh, for my life and that you, that you love me, you care for me and that you can uh, be my God. So I acknowledge you as that, my Lord and my God. Um, if that's you, we want to invite you to make contact with us so that uh, we can support you um, in your journey of faith, um, especially those first steps uh, which we've all uh, walked through. Those are sometimes quite tentative and difficult steps to take. So there are three ways in which you can do that. You can WhatsApp us um, on the WhatsApp, uh, which, which is uh, appearing before you. Then you can also um, uh, put your hand up in the chat. Uh, simply just put a hand up in the chat. Um, or otherwise, if you'd like to rather go onto the NUMA website, um, find our website and fill out a connect card there and we'll come back into touch with you. Um, yes, I want to land there. Bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Numa family, as we are preparing to dig into tithes and offering, I just wanted to share something with you guys really quickly. Earlier in the week, um, we put out a social media post asking you guys, our community, our Numa family, to help us in support of our neighbors in Langa who were impacted by the fire that happened over the weekend. And I was so personally encouraged by the response that came from you guys, the, the willingness to give of food and of clothing um, to our neighbors during this time. So thank you guys so much for that. And as we're preparing to give, whether it's of our finances or of our time today, I just want to pray for us. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for your presence here with us today. I thank you for the opportunity to partner with you in the things that you're doing throughout the city of Cape Town. And I thank you that as we give today, God, that it would be a blessing unto your sons and daughters. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask these things. Amen. For announcements this week, I've only got one thing to tell you guys, and it's pretty important, like super important. It's the month of May. What happens in May? Mother's Day is on May the 8th, and we are going to celebrate our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunties, our cousins who are mothers. So join us for that. Mark your calendars. You can join us in person or online. But we're going to celebrate mothers on Mother's Day, May the 8th. We look forward to seeing you there. Have an amazing week.